The Secrets of Technology is brought to you by the StarQuest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. You're listening to The Secrets of Technology. Hi, I'm Dom Bettinelli, and you're listening to The Secrets of Technology, where we discuss the technology news that's important to you from a uniquely Catholic point of view. And joining me today on the panel are Jack Barazzini. Hi, Jack. Hey, Dom. How's it going? Very well, thanks. And Thomas Sanherho. Hey, Thomas. Hey, Dom. So uh, we want to start this week with a, uh, a listener, another listener question. I'm loving the fact that listeners are sending in questions that we can help with. Uh, we, you know, we do our best. We're not, you know, we, we don't necessarily know everything. But uh, if you've got questions about using technology, we'd love to help out. And uh, so this question comes in from listener Ryan, who uh, writes, I'm 18 and heading off to college. I've never used social media before, aside from Google Hangouts, but I've created Instagram and Facebook accounts to connect with fellow students before arriving on campus. What are some good general security practices I should use? I already use highly complex passwords, but I'm especially interested in the safety of posting pictures. I don't post any pictures that I took at home, and I haven't posted any photos yet that show my face, but I know that's definitely not the norm. Seemingly, everyone on the Facebook group for my college's class of 2024 has their senior photos and their introductory posts. I want to make sure to wisely manage my online presence from the start so they don't have to worry about old posts, etc., giving me trouble down the road. So what kind of advice do we want to give them on? So this it seems like there's two things. There's security practices, how to keep your account secure. And then there's uh, personal information security practices, like how do I make sure that my in, my privacy is respected as well? So what kind of advice do you want to give to Ryan here on this? I would say with the photos, with the security, make sure everything is locked down and as private as possible. And with Facebook, they constantly kind of go behind your back and change how their security settings work. <laughs> make sure you stay on top of yeah, the yes. security settings. And secondly, for the photos, at this point, since you've not posted anything, you basically have a choice between not ever posting pictures of yourself that are personally identifiable or accepting the fact that if you post those pictures, they are out there on the Internet and they will be out there on the Internet forever. And I would, I would hazard to say you have to be really careful of choosing the former because what's going to end up happening is the pictures of you are going to get out there. Uh, if you're going to a party and someone is using Facebook and they take a picture and you're in the background, there is now a picture of you. So uh, the two options that you have to weigh are uh, how mm -hmm. incognito do you think you can be <laughs> yes. versus managing your presence online. And I think that's what we need to start moving towards more is rather than thinking of, you know, eliminating my presence online is managing my presence online and making sure that the things that I'm presenting are genuinely me are verifiably me and they s establish a certain character of who I am so that if there is something that's out of character, um, it can be weighed against the, the larger set of things that I have done that right. are more my character. It's, it's so unlike me growing up, you know, I, I'm older than, than you guys too, but I think it's probably so similar for you guys growing up, you know, you did stupid things with your friends and yeah, there were, there are photos out there that I hope don't, hit the light of day but you know those were shared among friends and they're probably buried in somebody's damp mildewy <laughs> basement at this point now like no matter what you do it's recorded for all time on you know uh, you know on facebook or on instagram it's certainly in the internet archive you know what i mean so it's like everything you do is a record that will be delved into in the future so um there there so from that point of view Going into this with the mindset of I am being aware of how I'm presenting myself is not a bad thing, because um, right. frankly we should always. It's it, it in, in some ways it's like a hundred years ago. A gentleman in public was always on his best behavior, or should or was expected to be, you know, and and that's not a bad thing necessarily. So we should always be will, you know looking to put to represent ourselves the way we want to be seen. Um, I think a good rule of thumb is don't say anything you would not say in person to someone. 
Because it's a lot easier yeah. to just pop yeah. off online without yes. thinking about, would you actually do that if you were speaking face-to-face with somebody? That's right. That's right. Um, the, that's the huge, the, the huge danger is online is we stop seeing the person on the other end as a person. We, we, right. but there's this barrier between, between us and them of the written word and maybe a profile photo but we but it's easy to forget this is a person and some people have good days and some have bad days and maybe Mm -hmm. they're having a bad day and that's why they're presenting themselves to you in this way so you know that 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 annoys you even or you're having a bad day Uh, so it's always best to to think twice you know right if you have Mm -hmm. to write it out in like a text doc (laughs) Save it for a bit. Yeah. Don't touch it, and then come back to it later. Because and reread it. Yes, yes. <laughs> and, and uh, I've, make sure you agree with it. Still, <laughs> uh, I think I've deleted more posts than I've posted in the past year. Mm-hmm. So this, that, yeah. I, I, on the security side, too. Some other things to be considered about. First off, always two-factor authentication. Everything. Yes, you you, you must. It is not an option at this point. Um, and then for the pictures, uh, I, you mentioned that you haven't taken any at home. That's good practice. Uh, be careful of the geotagging because that's one of the big things that uh, is kind of a hidden background security issue, uh, whether or not your pictures are automatically geotagged on your phone. And I can't give you the the steps of how to fix it because it's you know, different for every phone, but there is a way to turn off geotagging on your photos. Right. There are also apps, depending on the uh, phone, it's different apps for different uh, uh, iPhone or Android, but there are apps that will strip the uh, EXIF data, it's called, uh, the, including the geotag data uh, before you post something online. Okay. So there's there are those as well. So keep that in mind as well. Okay, folks, uh, sorry about that. Uh, there is a, a, a little jump there. You didn't hear most of that. I think uh, hopefully I cut all of that out. But uh, I had some computer issues on me. And ironically, uh, the, on the tech podcast, we were having uh, tech issues. But uh, my, my Mac decided to do something else while I was trying to record a podcast. And uh, I had to get its attention back. But I think we're good now. So we were talking to Ryan about uh, some of the best practices for being a new user of social media as he goes off to college. And so we we mentioned get two-factor authentication on your accounts. And Instagram and Facebook both allow you to do two-factor authentication. Um, we talked about stripping out your geotagging, your geodata off of the any photos that you post. Um, and, and the fact that you're going to be in pictures. It's just the, 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 the world we live in now. So not to worry too much about pictures with your, with your face on it. That's just the way it is. Um, and we talked about just behavior online, just behave online. Like you are your, your future boss, your future spouse are all looking at it. Uh, you know, Cause five years hence, cause they are <laughs> right. Um, be the person yeah. you want to, you want them to see you as be the person you want to be online. Um, and don't, and don't forget <laughs> that you are being seen online. Um, there's there's locking down your accounts. So the, um, friending, public posts. I generally, I'm, I'm a public person in most cases, so I post most of my things public. If I were to go back and do it all over again, I might post more things just to friends and I would be more selective about who I let be friends, I guess. Um, mm. So... There's something to consider there as well. How much you make, how many of your posts you make public. Although Thomas, you recently were saying, I think that you want to have some public posts. You want to have some right. evidence of who you are on out there for for career purposes. Right. So as we, when we were talking about the the job hunt the other day, I, I think it's it's a it's an important part of of uh, who you are online to make sure that you are. Uh, managing that presence because it, it is a little bit of a brand management campaign at this point. You are your brand is what you're putting out as your name, and it's a simple search away. All they have to do is check your resume, take your name, plug it into a browser, and they're going to find you on these uh, social media sites. So what you want them to find is what you want to show of yourself. You know, if you're doing community service. Uh, there are a lot of companies that love seeing people do community service. I know that mm-hmm. um, I know for a fact that I, I'm working closely with some people that work at Microsoft, and that's a big component of how they look for employees is whether or not that person's involved in their community. Uh, so you know, share that kind of thing. Uh, you don't have to be obnoxious about it, and that be the only thing that you're sharing. So right. you can share more, but uh, 
you know, make sure that that stuff is public, that that's not just posted to your friends, but that that's stuff that people are seeing of you and of you doing. And it goes without saying that should be authentic things you're doing. Right, like, right. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Don't just like show up somewhere yeah. and take a picture of yourself. And then... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. See me at this event. Yeah. yeah. So uh, that's Another... good, too. Yep. Go ahead. Another thing I would say, I've already done this, go and buy the domain name that's associated with your name just to have that. Even if you mm. don't end up using it, it's not that expensive. Yeah. yeah. A few that's bucks a, a year. Idea. Yeah. Um, yeah, because, you, you know, you may want that uh, somebody, somebody down the line with your uh, resume, you know, a job site, a family thing. I mean, that, that's certainly, um, yeah, I, I think I think more people should be buying more domains, frankly. Um, <laughs> like, like. Like your family name, family.net or com or whatever is probably not yeah. a bad thing, especially if you have an unusual name like I do, or actually all three of us have an uh, <laughs> out of somewhat a little out of the ordinary name. We're not Smith or Jones. Uh, and so that like more likely to be available. Bettinelli.com is taken. It uh, It's a, <laughs> nice. it's a vineyard in, in California, which makes me feel better. Uh, oh, well, that, that's there's not a too bad. Bet, yeah, there's a Bettinelli <laughs> Could be worse, vineyard. right? <laughs> yeah. We're not related, unfortunately, but <laughs> they do make nice wine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, to get your yeah, get your domain. Um start and or start thinking about a domain. That's actually not a bad idea. Maybe we should bring that up as a future segment uh mm -hmm. on a future episode, but you know, why should a regular person own a domain even if they don't have a website or they or they maybe they're planning to someday and what kinds of domains we should be thinking about and how to get them? You can even have your domain name redirect to your Facebook or your LinkedIn until you, if you don't do anything yeah, else right. with it. That's right. right. That's right. That's, that's those are all good. So if uh, if you have any other questions, I hope that helps, Ryan. But uh, and, and anyone else have any other questions along these lines? We'd be happy to revisit the topic. But uh, I hope that was some good advice. All right. So let's move on to our uh, our primary topic tonight. Um, lately, recently, I, I think I mentioned on a, pr a previous uh, episode, I I had a I got a new um, well, I was going to say new toy, but no, no, it's a, a device that's an important tool, not a toy. Uh, there you go. That's yes. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> it, it's providing a, 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 a necessary function in my home. I got a Raspberry Pi, which uh, in case you don't know, a Raspberry Pi is a small, inexpensive computer that that is as, as little as a, a credit card size, uh, can be as inexpensive if you get a a Pi Zero is inexpensive as thirty dollars, but it's a it's a full fledged computer. It, it runs the Linux operating system uh, out of the box, you know, that, or uh, to get started, let's put it that way. Uh, and it it also has the ability to connect to various things. And sort of the world, the the the, the sky's the limit uh, uh, for what you can do with this. And so we wanted to explore today some ways that you might, uh, as the the listener, might be interested in. Pick, if you if you have at all any interest in this sort of thing, picking up a Raspberry Pi and do, using it for things, for fun things, for learning things, and for useful things. Uh, one thing I'll mention right off the bat, because this came up in a previous episode, uh, Father Corey, who you know who who uh, co-hosts with us occasionally, he used it in his parish uh, as a fax machine, did so that it connected. He uh, used some third-party open-source software, connected it to a phone line. And because he didn't want to have to buy a fax machine and have it spit out paper all the time. So it's a fax server. Faxes come in, they store on the Raspberry Pi, and then he gets it as an email and no piles of paper everywhere because faxes are terrible, but the church has tons of them. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. Anybody who works in the church knows that the church still lives by faxes in many ways. And, that and, and look, uh, you're, you're skipping a step there, too. No scanning the document in. It just, it's there. It's digitally yes. stored. So that's, that's fantastic. Right. That's right. And you can send a document without printing it. You know, you just send it from Word or whatever. So, uh, yeah, it's uh, so that's like one one example. Uh, but so, so guys, so I wanted to open it to you. Like, you know, what are some because I know you both are interested in this area of uh, maker hobbies, it's sometimes called mm -hmm. or uh, that sort of thing. So uh, what's some Raspberry Pi or s similar to Raspberry Pi, other sorts of small computing uh projects would you would you want to recommend to that folks check out uh thomas why don't we start that's, with you uh that's one of the things i wanted i wanted to kind of tag up on you there like saying this is not a toy is a really big deal because i mm -hmm. think a lot of people think that it's a toy because it's so small but these are really actually very powerful machines if you think about them as computers without all the bells and whistles 
Um, so it is a computer in its most basic form. It's got a storage system. It's got some input output ports and it's got uh, all of the, the hardware that it needs to run things. So memory and the CPU and all that kind of stuff. What it doesn't have is a video card. Um, it doesn't, you know, you're not, when you buy the $30 machine, you're not getting a keyboard and a, a screen. So you're going to need those things added on to it. So mm-hmm. be aware of that. But it comes with an HDMI port. So you can plug it directly into your new TV that probably has 20 HDMI ports on the back of it anyway. <laughs> right. Uh, and um, and you can use it that way. Uh, so there's there's a lot of things that you can do with this. And I want to differentiate it from other types of microcontrollers because I think that's something else that you can get into the weeds on with uh, like Arduinos and um, other uh, electronics boards that aren't full-fledged computers, but that mm-hmm. kind of get packaged the same way and get sold the same way. So just be aware that a, a Raspberry Pi is a computer, but a microcontroller is not necessarily a computer. Uh, so right. be, be aware when you're looking at them uh, for those things. Um, the two, the two uh, projects that I want to mention that I think are really cool, uh, one is very, uh, very much my kind of thing. Uh, I'm a 3D printer, and the 3D printer that you get is very direct functional. Uh, it's got its own proprietary software. Most likely it runs in a very limited capacity on a certain set of code. And one of the problems with that is, is that there's no way to expand on the software side of it. Mm. Uh, so you're kind of stuck with whatever shipped with your machine. However, there is a program called Octoprint 3D that allows you to take a Raspberry Pi and kind of hijack your uh, print system with the Raspberry Pi. And it's got a whole bunch of junk built into it that recognizes what kind of machine you have, uh, knows how to communicate with it. So it's like I got all the background, um, you know, drivers and things for your different machines. And basically you just replace kind of the brain of your uh, 3D printer with a Raspberry Pi. And this adds a bunch of functionality because normally you have to kind of plug things in to print them. So you have to like take an SD card out, plug it into your computer, download the file with the SD card, put it on, put it back into the uh, printer and print. With a Raspberry Pi, you could just connect it to the network. And right. you can just upload prints directly there. You can give it all sorts of functionality so that it knows if something goes wrong, it can tell you. You can put a webcam on your printer so that it's got a constant feed of what uh, what you're seeing for the uh, for the printer, and it's not external to the printer itself. It's just part of the printer's brain that you can just put that on and lights. Uh, there's a ton of stuff that you can do with Octoprint. It's really a fantastic program. It's actually one of my next projects if I can convince one of my kids to give up their um, Raspberry Pis for me to do it. <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice. That we is have like really six great. in the house. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, that's really combines two really geeky projects, which is 3D printing and, and a Raspberry right. Pi. Uh, yeah. I, I like that idea, though, because yeah, the, because once you can network it, there's all kinds of things you can monitor. Because a 3D print job is unlike the TV and movies takes a long time usually like right. hours or yeah. days and so if something goes wrong in the middle you don't want to be have to stand there and watch it so if it's if it's connected it can do all kinds of monitoring and control and all that sort of stuff in addition to all the other things you mentioned I think that's a really neat idea uh Thomas what, uh, I mean uh, Jack what what do you have for a project uh, that you want to recommend so first up, I have one. I know we've been talking about this as a useful tool, and it definitely is, but I think this is a good project to start with into the Raspberry Pi before even coding with Linux. It's called RetroPi, and it's basically a Super Nintendo, um, like Atari Nintendo 64 emulator that you can run off of Raspberry Pi, and it's really simple to set up. Um, there's not a lot of extra things you have to do. You just need a monitor, and you need a USB gamepad, which you can get from Amazon for really cheap. Um, and it's pretty straightforward. It walks you through everything you need to do. Um, you can find to, um, people have actually even made for it that are not on good play. Um, but it's a re- for like a first time Raspberry Pi product. And uh, to tie into what you were talking about, Thomas, there's actually on Thingiverse a mini NES Raspberry Pi case that you can 3D print for it. I was going to say, right. exactly. It's, you, can, you can print the case that yeah, you can exactly. use to plug so. everything in. <laughs> and it looks just like an old school NES. <laughs> 
let me describe the Pi for, uh, for you. There's several different version kinds. There's um, the Pi Zero, which is a very small, the most inexpensive one. Uh, but the more capable devices are, uh, well, there was like a Pi 3, which is a, like a year or so old, and the newer one, which is the Pi 4. Uh, and that's what I got because I just, I just bought it. And it comes with varying amounts of RAM, uh, like a computer does. So one, two, four, and eight gigs. Um, and it has various inputs and outputs. So it has four USB ports, it has an SD card slot, which is essentially like its hard drive that holds the, the operating system. Um, it has a, a HDMI port, like you mentioned. It has, um, I think of all the other ports it has. Uh, Some of them have Ethernet cables, although they're moving right. more towards wireless now. Right. It has, so they will, yeah, they'll have a wireless uh, antenna on it. They have Wi-Fi on it, usually. Uh, at least the, the Pi 4 does. But yeah, they also you can also get an Ethernet um, power, obviously, that sort of thing. And then there's uh, pins, like the uh, pin slots on it that can be programmed to connect to various sensors, motors, lights. You They, they have a Raspberry Pi camera that you can get, all kinds of stuff like that. Um, you can buy the kits on Amazon. And for example, the Raspberry Pi uh, 4 gigabyte uh, starter kit, which comes with comes with all kinds of stuff, including a case and heat sinks and fans and, you know, all this extra stuff that isn't, strictly speaking, the Pi itself for a hundred bucks. And I mean, you're ready to go. I think it also comes with a keyboard and mouse. Does it? I, the one, the one in the link, I don't think does. You can find them with that, but you can use any any keyboard and mouse, any keyboard and mouse yeah. right any yeah. usb keyboard and mouse will work so uh, that that would work fine yeah i the kit i got had the keyboard and mouse it was a was a different case uh not as good of a case actually because it doesn't have a fan in it and uh but it, it the keyboard and mouse are okay they're a little light and cheap but what do you get mm-hmm. what do you expect if i wanted it i have a, I have a closet full of keyboards and mice if I need it really right. to improve. And you can buy all sorts of accessories for them too. Like there are yeah. touch screens that go sp- that specifically mount to the Raspberry Pi. There are all all sorts of uh, lights and uh, speakers systems that plug into it. You can do all of the electronics kit stuff that I was talking about with the microcontrollers yep. um, with a Raspberry Pi if you want to. Uh, so, you know, if, if you're interested in that, but you want something that's a little more expansive, uh, then, yeah, you definitely get a Raspberry Pi and get an electronics kit, like a, an Arduino electronics kit to go along right. with it. Right, right. The Pi that's is good. really good to get into if you want to start messing around with electronics without learning how to do a breadboard right off the bat. Mm-hmm. That's true. That's true. Definitely agree with that. So we'll have a, I'll have a link to the the, the uh, Raspberry Pi kit that I mentioned uh, in the show notes, but... Uh, um, so, uh, Thomas, what, what about another project did you, that you want to mention? So on that note of electronics, um, I teach uh, uh, middle schoolers, and one of the things that we do is the Lego Mindstorm uh, robot. And uh, it's a fantastic thing. If you've never seen a Lego, the Lego First competitions, I definitely recommend that you check them out. Um, they're, they're really cool. They're tabletop uh, challenges that the kids have to build completely from scratch uh, a robot out of Lego that has uh, there's some lego compatible motors that go with it and they have to put this lego thing on the table and then program it to drive around and do things on the table and while i love it um the programming is very limited the programming is really straightforward uh drag and drop bricks uh just kind of in that lego fashion you know so you you grab grab blocks of code and kind of snap them together to make things work um but it's it's very limited in its structure so there is a company called um, uh, Dexter Industries that has created this thing called the Brick Pi. And what they've done is they've just taken the, the Mindstorm's brain, which is the, the, you know, the central com- the Lego computer for those uh, motors and things, and they've replaced it with a Pi. And so you just take a Pi and you download this uh, software onto it, and then you can plug all of the different motors and sensors that um, the Lego Mindstorm's robots use into uh, the Pi. So if you are a parent who has bought a Mindstorms for your kid and they're like, oh, I don't want to do it anymore. It's not very interesting. And you want to kind of revamp that project for real cheap because the Mindstorm itself is not cheap. <laughs> so right. just, just keep that in mind. Uh, but if you wanted to revamp that project for real cheap, you could just buy a Raspberry Pi and say, hey, now you get to learn Linux, uh, do some programming and uh, figure out how to do a much more involved robot using all those same sensors that you learned about, but now with more uh, flexibility and openness uh, to be able to add stuff to it. 
That's awesome. Yeah. Oh, I mean, if we can do something with all those Legos laying around, all right. <laughs> make, make some use of them. Uh, so no, that's a, that's, that's really interesting. Uh, to, uh, Jack, what, what do you have for another uh, project you want to recommend? Another project I'd recommend is um, I like all the different music-based things you can do with the Raspberry Pi. Um, I found an article here. Um, we can link it in the show notes, um, but it's a bunch of different projects. Uh, you can build a MIDI controller. You can build a theremin, which the theremin in the article they have does not include, like, you know, you play a theremin by moving your hands around the antennas. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to see if someone could combine that with, like, a Kinect controller or something like that. The one mm -hmm. in the article is just switches. But that'd be cool. But the main thing that I liked about this was the uh, pedal pie, the guitar effects pedal you can build with it. Mm. And so that allows you to basically program in any effect you're going to you're going to do. Um, and it looks pretty straightforward to build. You add in some uh, additional switches for the controller, um, but you can add pretty much unlimited effects. So that instead of having 10 different pedals, you can have one that controls everything. And they make digital guitar effects pedals like this, but they're really really pricey and this looks like something you can build for maybe less than 200 if you add all the bells and whistles cool wow that's really cool um and you also had uh something in the show notes about uh something to do with an arduino uh, which is a microcontroller yeah it's a bit different from the raspberry pi it's not as entry level um, but something I've been looking at actually building is I've wanted to get an electronic bagpipe for a long time because um, I have my full set but it's hard to play that in the home, in the house and not get yelled at or played outside <laughs> and have neighbors throwing things at you. So, and I've looked into them and there's companies that make them, but they run upwards of 700 to a thousand dollars. And there's a project I found it's called the E Chanter and you can build it using the Arduino. Uh, I think it's called the Arduino zero for about mm -hmm. $50. Use a PVC pipe for the um, actual body of the pipe chanter, which is what you play the melody on. And then you use uh, nails or screws for the uh, capacitive touch sensors instead of having the holes on a uh, wind instrument. That is really um, so cool. I'm, yeah. I'm actually going to look at building <laughs> that and I'll get back to you on that, how that goes. Wow. That is awesome. And then, it's it's electronic, so you plug in headphones and you can hear yourself playing? Plug in headphones so you can practice silently without getting yelled at, which has happened before. So <laughs> <laughs> That is awesome. That is so cool. I like that. It, it's just amazing, like the things you can do with these. You can just build these things with a little bit of knowledge. And I love the idea that kids can pick up this, you know, this inexpensive project and and learn a, a, a skill that goes way beyond, you know, r r uh, Legos in, and that sort of, you know, classic right. games, because Definitely. these are skills they can carry with them through life. Even if they don't go into computer science or some or programming job, being able to take control of your computer and make it do what you want mm -hmm. is a skill that you can you can use in every uh, uh, um, every job, every career path out there. It's like knowing how to change your oil at this point. Yes. Right, exactly. And if you want a really entry level um, Raspberry Pi, the Kano Pies are fantastic. Um, Kano is a company that uh, sells uh, entry level Raspberry Pis, and they come with uh, they come with a keyboard, an HDMI cable, power strip, and a lot of software preloaded onto the Raspberry Pi Linux that teaches a kid how to use Bash commands, how to do scripting, how to do some basic Python. Uh, it includes a, a small version of Minecraft that then uh, they they can hack the back doors of it and make it uh, their own version of Minecraft so they can change the way that the bricks work or cool. the way that the world generates, things like that. Um, my kids have loved that. That's been every one of them's gotten one uh, at, at about uh, eight years old. Uh, we give those and it's good for that uh, that age level because they need to be able to read uh, enough to get through some of the challenges but at the same time it's low enough level for them that they're going to still be interested in it uh, because it plays just like a game you move a little character around on the screen and go to the different areas and learn all the different stuff that's going on there interesting i'll have to look at that because I, I have hmm. a child and that right in, in that go. demographic who i think would <laughs> it would be good for him uh that's cool um, one of the things I want to recommend, since we're talking about uh, ways to, to to learn more about this, um, is there's a there's a site called humblebundle.com, and what they do is they 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 sell bundles usually of software, sometimes of hardware, sometimes books or, or audiobooks. They bundle them together and sell them for charity, so that they're, they're what they they most of the money is raised uh, goes toward a or some of the money anyway 
uh, goes to charity. The the what what's good about it is that it's hundreds of dollars sometimes off the list price what you pay for it. So they have a humble bundle of Raspberry Pi books and magazines that uh, they have available. I picked it up, and it's pay what pay what you think it's worth. Although if the more you the more you pay the the more you get if you if you pay and it's like it's like when I say like more you pay I think it was like fifteen bucks it's, right fifteen bucks gets you the whole thing normally get, yeah for the books and, yeah and we're talking dozens of books and magazines uh, frankly probably more than I'll ever look at but uh, <laughs> yeah <laughs> it, so many w- amazing ideas amazing. Uh, projects that are possible. Uh, you get them, and you get them all in electronic format. So I, there's a link there. the The bundle is available for as we record this the next eleven days, uh, ten days as we release this. And uh, so d- d- I will definitely... say they they yeah. do that bundle every so often. It's every six months or so oh, they okay. will run another Raspberry Pi bundle, just because it kind of keeps up with the technology as it's changing. Oh, and it's, okay. it's it's really an evergreen bundle. Like it's something they can put up in six months and people are going to buy it just as readily as they did now. <laughs> right. Yeah, it is. Uh, yeah. Cause there's always, especially because there's new people like me coming in to figure right. out what to, what they can do with it. Um, so that's really, yeah. So that I want to recommend that that's a, that's a, a nice thing to do. Uh, anything else you guys want to recommend as uh, p- potential raspberry Pi projects that people could do? I've got a couple off the cuff ones that you can do um, because it is Ethernet capable and because you can do it, you can use it as a wireless or as just plugging it into your network. Using it as a small server for your house is a really good idea. Um, I have done this. This is a very successful way to use these. Um, I use it as a media server. So you, there's mm-hmm. a, a great make use of article uh, that will link uh, that uh, talks about how, several different ways that you can uh uh, take your Raspberry Pi and make it into a media server. Uh, and so what you do is you just, you know, rip all your DVDs into a digital format, put them onto uh, a storage device that's plugged into the Pi, and the Pi serves them up. And uh, it, there's some very lightweight Linux programs that you that are really easy to install, uh, very straightforward. And once you get it on your network and get it connected with your uh, smart TV or your Roku or whatever device you have, um, it's really easy to just switch through and use them as uh, a device that you can watch your movies from. So get rid of your DVD player and replace it with a, a you know credit card sized computer. <laughs> nice. I would also say um, if you're paranoid like me and don't trust Ring or Nest, you can also build your own uh, security system with it. Yeah. In fact, I was going to mention, and I mentioned last time, I think it was last time, um, the open source project Homebridge, uh, which mm-hmm. is kind of related to that. And what that is, is it's a software that can run on the Pi, and it will bridge between, It's this is mostly for Mac users, it will bridge uh, between HomeKit, which is Apple's implementation of home, smart home uh, software, and non-HomeKit compatible hardware, like Nest and Ring and those, and you know, other things like that, various cameras, all kinds of stuff, garage door openers, all kinds of stuff. And uh, I, my, my mind is still blown. Like, I can, I can finally go into one place on my iPad or my phone and turn <laughs> lights on and off and change the thermostat and look at the camera. In fact, I find the that the Ring cameras, the Ring doorbell, is more responsive in the Apple Home app than it is in mm. the Ring app for whatever <laughs> reason, uh, probably better programmed. Uh, and code, yeah. the community <laughs> of uh, plug-in developers are so responsive. One of the things I I was asking on there was, you know, hey, you could put a Raspberry Pi in your home kit, like in uh, the 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 Apple Home um, app itself as a device, as a smart home device. And I said, is there a way to get a notification if it overheats? Because they, they have a tendency to get hot. They're very small contained devices. And if you put them in a box and you're in a hot room, they could get hot. And that's why some of them come with fans or heat sinks and that sort of thing. The, the Pies do. Uh, and I said, I want to monitor the heat. So it's because if it gets too hot, it throttles down. It start, stops working as well. And the guy said, huh, well, you could do this. That, Within a day, he modified, updated his mm-hmm. plugin. And now uh, I can, I'll can i get a notification from Apple Home if my Raspberry Pi gets above a certain temperature. Like, that is amazing. That's, That's awesome. awesome. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, I love that. So it's homebridge.io. And it was... Most of it was fairly easy to figure out. The and I think I mentioned before the the Ring stuff is easy. The Nest stuff and all the Google stuff is is a, mm-hmm. it's not hard. It's tedious because you've got to dig around in web pages, source code, 
in order to get yeah. certain code and that sort of stuff. So eh, there's that. But uh, yeah, so the, but you can also set up um, video camera surveillance system so that it's local and it's recording local uh, data uh, in doorbells and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. So yes, definitely you could do that. One thing I want to mention is a YouTube channel from a friend of SQPN, Jeff Gearling, longtime friend of the of the network, uh, who uh, his YouTube channel. He's been he he's a developer guy. He's into he does Ansible and something else, basically stuff that's more advanced than I understand what it is. But uh, but he also <laughs> loves his Raspberry Pis, and he's developed a he's got his channel where he has a bunch of Raspberry Pi uh, based information, some videos like. Can he, he tried to replace his MacBook Pro for a day to use it, the Pi as his primary computer. So can you do that? Uh, what what sort of sacrifice do you have to make? Um, he also hacked his, the Pi case to put a fan in it. And um, then, he, uh, but the one thing the project he's been doing is turning the Pies, like a cluster of Pies, so connecting them all into a Turing, an AI, basically a Turing device, which is, that all of the like a multiple pies all working together to solve computational problems. Yeah. Uh, pretty amazing. It's, it's a neural. It's a very very creative use of the pies for a neural network. It's it's really impressive uh, yeah. watching what he's done with those. Yeah, I don't understand everything, but uh, I enjoy watching it. <laughs> and there's certain, but there are definitely videos that I do understand what he's doing. Um, and uh, and that's actually the thing is, is YouTube has tons of cool Raspberry Pi videos that you can find all kinds of stuff on. So that's another. Yeah. There's lots of good communities out there for that. Yeah. So if you're wondering about something, you'll probably be able to find an answer or someone who can help you with it. Right. Definitely. Definitely. So uh, if, if you, any of you listeners have uh, interesting projects you've done with your Pi or other questions about Raspberry Pi or Arduino or other microcontroller sort of devices, let us know. We'd be happy to uh, bring it up in a future episode. So let's move on to talk about some headlines. Thomas, I've saved an, yet another one for you yes i'm loving it <laughs> <laughs> no wrong wrong fast food company <laughs> wrong, wrong fast food company but <laughs> so here's the headline kfc <laughs> that's right the former kentucky fried chicken that is now the three-letter acronym is working with a russian because it has to be russian 3d print bioprinting firm to make lab produced chicken nuggets because <laughs> of course they are <laughs> <laughs> so what do you guys think is this is this the wave of the future are we are we totally going to be getting away from you know raising meat on the farm and bioprinting our meat in the future it might be an improvement on the current kfc chicken but i don't want to try it <laughs> <laughs> i i am actually intrigued like it's be you know i mentioned this last time we talked about printed food that um there is a lot of research going into figuring out how textures uh in food uh, are come about like how what the 3d structures that create textures in food are and it looks really promising like it looks bizarrely promising and so i i would be happy to try a 3d printed uh piece of meat uh, especially a chicken nugget because i mean there's basically if you look at the way a chicken nuggets made well, now yeah you know, <laughs> it's just emulsified chicken yeah, so exactly. it's not any it's less not far artificial. from 3d printed right <laughs> yeah. yeah right, right. <laughs> so uh they're, they're 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 talking about not just 3d printing the chicken nuggets though they're actually talking about getting all the way through to something like a drumstick and um i i'm really intrigued at what that kind of thing is going to look like as it as we move forward uh, and I, I think it's fantastic because I really, I, I don't like, if you've ever, you know, Super Size Me, Fast Food Nation are two great books you need to read about uh, how the fast food uh, industry works in our country and what, uh, you know, what the conditions are like on these farms. Uh, not not from a, a totally ethical standpoint, even if, even if you don't want to get into the ethics of it, the just environmental impacts of it and the mm -hmm. economic impacts of it are intense. And if we could move away from that to a plant-based diet that does everything everybody wants for right. the texture and the feel and the, the taste of the food. I would love that. I think it would be great. Although I would caution the plant ag uh, agriculture right now is also not gr necessarily great for the well, environment. Or ethics. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> yeah. so there, that we, we still have issues to address there. Well, and one of the things that, that with this KFC nugget does have chicken in it. It uses chicken mm -hmm. and cells and plant material. But what what makes this interesting is the idea that the, it changes the food chain, the whole chain of logistics of how do we get food from here to there and what's involved mm -hmm. in 
and processing it. And it makes things less expensive, which means it's less expensive for the consumer. It makes it easier so that we can get more food to more people in more places. I mean, I'm not necessarily concerned about chicken nuggets. I'm concerned about people starving in Sudan, you know, that sort of thing. If we can create Star Trek replicators to feed starving people around the world, that's really what, you know, is an, would be amazing all on its own. I think the implications for this for space exploration in the future are really, oh, really yeah. cool. Like speaking of Star Trek, but like yeah. on Mars, you it's probably going to be difficult to have a chicken farm on Mars, but people still need protein. So <laughs> that's right. Yeah. That's right. They used to call it on Star Trek textured protein. That you know they would there like they were looking mm-hmm. you know forward to that what it would be. Yeah. Something else I was wondering is you mentioned a drumstick, and those things are kind of a pain to eat. So maybe they can make a better <laughs> drumstick. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. That's what I'm, that's what I'm thinking. Like you know, it's just it's a stick with uh, meat that feels the same way that a drumstick does, but none of that other junk inside the that you have to get around. Right. <laughs> I need it. <laughs> if you sl- slap some buffalo wing sauce on it, it's I'm all I'm all there. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so uh, our next article is um, uh, speaking of dystopian uh, fears uh, is about this um, something called bad power and what it is. Uh, a bunch of Chinese security researchers said that they've discovered a way that they can alter the firmware of fast chargers. These are special phone and pad chargers and computer chargers, I would assume, that are designed to charge your device faster because batteries are getting bigger. It takes longer to charge, so it charges them faster. And they found a way to alter the firmware, the instructions built into these chargers that could cause the damage or even to cause them to catch on fire. Uh, mm-hmm. And what the way they do it is the, the or the the proof of concept is, is that they could plug in a phone or tablet that has the bad, you know, the viral whatever you want to call it, bad software on it. Plug it into the charger. It downloads it to the firmware on the charger, and then the next phone that connects to it or the next whatever that connects to it gets the, you know, the bad power and could could catch on fire. Um, the so there's a couple things here. It's it's proof of concept. It's, there's no one saying that this is out there. Um, they could, they said that they could update the firmware. You know, the right. manufacturers could update firmware to fix it, which means anything being manufactured from here on out would, is probably okay. But I don't know about you, but most of my chargers do not have any way to update the firmware on them. Right. So, yeah. But on the other hand, it's kind of a dumb attack. It requires physical access um, and it it doesn't get you anything except blowing something up. It's just pure maliciousness. I think that, yeah, I think that for the most part, this isn't going to be something that most people have to worry about. I would worry more about if there was a way to have your phone send incorrect information to the charger itself, which would just send the wrong voltage to the device and cause the device to overload, kind of the, uh, the opposite of what's going on right now. Right. Well, no, that's actually what it is. It's causing the device to, so the, yeah, they're they're changing the way that the charger works so that it's sending an incorrect charge back to the to the phone right mm-hmm. right so that yeah sorry i wasn't okay, clear on yeah. that yep no no that makes sense i was wondering if maybe they could just have the phones in an incorrect this is how much voltage i need to the charger in the first place and have the charger just spit it back out right right that's potentially another uh another kind of attack i would guess so they've alerted manufacturers they tested 35 fast chargers on the market 18 were vulnerable but there are hundreds of models out there yeah, I'm intrigued at the delivery mechanism because it doesn't seem like this is something that you could just get from, you know, like I, if I got a virus on my phone and then I plugged it into my USB-C power adapter, because that's what we're talking about is like, this has to yeah. be a USB-C uh, data transmittal system. So I plug it into my USB-C data, data system. I don't see how a virus could transmit a firmware update to... The thing. So I'm thinking this is more like one of those where they plug a USB device directly into um, the charger itself that has the virus in the firmware. And so I, I think this is more of a physical access issue. I'd yes. like to see the research. On, honestly, that's where I'm kind of like looking at this and I'm going, eh, I, knowing what I know <laughs> right. about this, I'm not worried. <laughs> yeah. That's what I was wondering about. It's like, how are you updating right. the firmware on the charger? Exactly. Yeah, so I'm place. thinking it's probably, it's a, it's a, it's a physical USB payload. So if you have one right. of those, you know, chargers that has a usb plug in it and so mm-hmm. it plugs into the wall and you plug your usb c cable into it and then you plug your or you, you plug the regular usb into it and then you plug your usb c into your phone right 
So what they probably did was they took a, a firmware updater that's got a right. USB plug, plugged it into that physical device, then let it go. Uh, and, and which is dangerous enough, right? That's, yes. you know, because uh, if you're in an airport and you just plug one of your US, well, that's what you know, I was firmware say. updaters in there. Yeah. You know, so be, be, be mindful, be careful. Don't just plug your device in and, and ignore it if you're in an unfamiliar place. Uh, kind of, kind of, frankly, that's why if you can get a Qi charger instead of plugging things in, you're probably yeah, better yeah. off. Don't plug into those exactly. airport things. Yeah. It's also just interesting to see how many things that we don't think about on a day-to-day basis have these vulnerabilities now because of all the smart devices we have. Like mm-hmm. someone can hack your light bulbs or your fridge now, which even 20 years ago, that's not something you would be worried about. <laughs> yeah, hacked your light bulb, right? <laughs> yeah. Talk, yeah. If, you, if I told myself 20 years ago that be careful, someone may hack your fridge. I'd be like, what? <laughs> what? Why would we be stupid enough to make our fridges hackable? Well, <laughs> they'll turn down the freezer. Oh, and no, no, no. And chicken nuggets go bad. <laughs> no. uh, so um, I don't know if either of you guys are baseball fans, but uh, baseball's back. <laughs> and uh, so, oh, boy. <laughs> you know, in the COVID era, everything is weird and different. And so there's nobody in the ballparks these days uh, in the in the stands. And so the the both Major League Baseball and the networks have been trying to figure out ways to make it feel more normal. And so they've they've taken a variety of uh, steps. Uh, some of the teams have been printing out cardboard standees of fans and putting them in stands. I'm not sure why, but okay. But Money. yeah, well, the, for some of them, they're selling them to people like you can put a, your own picture in behind, you know, home plate. I'm like, wow, I could not be at home plate. Like, virtually (laughs) which is silly Uh, but the one that really has got people going is fox sports has been digitally inserting a crowd into the their televised games and it's wicked creepy because Mm -hmm. what one of the things that happens so everybody so you have a variety of people a variety of shirts and that sort of thing and usually it's the home team's jerseys that they're wearing and uh they but there's only so many people like I don't know why they didn't hire like ILM or somebody to to, to do a good job, because there's like four <laughs> different uh, poses that they do, like leaning your head on one knee, one you know, on your uh, your fist and a knee, uh, putting both hands on your knees, uh, putting your hands by your side and then back again. And then you, the entire crowd is doing this. It, like not in unison, yeah. but enough that it's wicked creepy. And then when something happens, like somebody strikes out, there is a they very noticeable like two or three second delay before everyone reacts like like <laughs> it, it's like it would it would be better just to not do anything just leave the stands right. empty <laughs> but, but have you guys seen any of this Does any of this uh, strike you as yeah i have and it's it reminds me of like some of those older episodes of doctor who yes <laughs> like just, the, yeah. just the way it looks just like kind of not fantastic cgi either that or like Star Wars Episode One with all the extras yeah. in the background. It just it's too right. distracting. Yeah. yeah, it's it would be better to just leave the stands empty or just have the standees. You know, <laughs> just like uh, I don't know. I, I I it's interesting though because um there there are ways to do this that that would work, mm-hmm. but the, but we're we're almost it's almost like we're not there yet. I don't know if you guys saw the um, AI video of um. Uh, Richard Nixon reading the the failed lunar landing uh, right. uh, speech. Uh, so it, some of this stuff it, that that's happening is just really really amazing. And so I could see a, a room where an AI could take a picture of a crowd and then modify them based on their behaviors. Uh, we're like two steps from that though, and it's right. it you know the two steps that we're taking to get there is like seven years off. But well, it would be interesting to see what the capabilities there are. Eventually, I mean, the, the roots of this, like if you go back to Lord of the Rings and, you know, the return of the king and they were using that program called Massive to create these digital battle right. scenes, which were crude at the time, but really cool in advance too. well, take go forward 20 years. And now we're watching Endgame Avengers and seeing what that looks like. You know, it mm-hmm. can be done. Uh, although right. watching it, a static shot uh, of a game is different from a cinematic shot that's constantly moving. So right, the, I, 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 yeah, I, I get that it's it, it's a complex problem, but gosh, uh, it looks bad. Have you seen the NBA version of this? No. Oh, no, I haven't seen the NBA one. <laughs> uh, so they have these big screen screen walls lining the court and it's not 
artificial people, you can actually buy a ticket to be on uh, Microsoft Teams, I think it's called, or it's whatever huh. the Zoom equivalent huh. is. Uh, it's not Skype, which is the, another Microsoft product. And so you can be on this, like there, watching the game from your seat, and you are people can see you in the stands from the from the floor. The players can see you, and so what that you is see, pretty cool. Well, unfortunately, what you see is. People at different uh, distances from their camera, right, so they're different right. different perspectives, and everybody waves all the time. They're just waving because they want to see right. themselves on TV. <laughs> like stop, just stop, and then it, like they get kind of cut off because they go out of frame and stuff. Uh, it, it's it, at least it's not like everybody's all doing the same thing <laughs> at yeah. once. Yeah, but uh, yeah, it's it's a it's a whole new bizarre world we're living in. They should have <laughs> just been more creative with it and had it be orcs in the stand. <laughs> it's the this week it's the orcs cheering for <laughs> that would be that'd be pretty funny actually yeah, yeah. Well, the, the orcs versus the elves yeah the uh LA, oakland raiders could be have orcs as their fans that would be... <laughs> so uh see i would say be the cut but... <laughs> oh, 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 we're gonna start some stuff here <laughs> yeah that's right <laughs> so uh all right, so that that's I think I should do it for our headlines this week. Um, let's move on to our picks of the week. Uh, Jack, what's your pick this week? So you mentioned earlier about uh, your Raspberry Pi overheating, and you can either use that plugin you're talking about, or you can just stick it in mineral oil. Wow, um, this is something. Yeah. So the nice thing, the fun thing about mineral oil is it's non-conductive, so you can put electronics in it, and they will not short out. So I've actually I've not done this with a Raspberry Pi, but I've done this with an old uh, PC I took apart. We put it in a fish tank, and we put like gravel in it, and you know, uh, aquarium decorations. Fill it up with mineral oil, and put the components in there, and had it out where I used to work in the lobby, just as a cool like set piece uh-huh. um but people have done this with raspberry pi and it's nice because it's tiny you don't need a full-size fish tank you can get like a fish bowl or i even saw someone use they took an old apple uh g4 cube <laughs> and they took all the components out mm. and they use that as their fish bowl for their mineral oil pc and it conducts all the heat away it's pretty easy to do you can buy mineral oil online it's actually used for horses um it's not too expensive it's a fun project it's the one thing I would say is mineral oil is very difficult to get out. So if you're working with it, make sure you're not spilling it all over the carpet. Right. Um, but it's a fun thing. And even if you just want to set up like a weird little computer on your desk with that has all the components in liquid, just as a eye candy thing to show people, it's a lot of fun. It's maybe not the most practical thing, but it's cool. But definitely mineral oil, right? Not yes. olive oil. Yeah. Do not use oil. olive oil or any sort of vegetable oil or anything like that. That's not going to work. It has to be mineral oil. And you can okay. buy it and on Amazon. Inert. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or like Tractor Supply Company has it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I, I don't know if I'm there yet, but uh, that, that's, that, it's, it's yeah, cool. It's, <laughs> well, I have to ask now, now Jack, do you, did you guys, did you guys use like a pump system to, to cool the mineral oil or did you just let it sit? We actually had two fans. So we had on okay. either end of the fish tank, so it would circulate it around. Okay. You got, and so so the, the advantage here, I think that, that one of the things that you have to like remind people is that the, the problem with your computer overheating isn't that the whole thing gets hot. It's that a single spot right. gets hot. Yeah. And the advantage to the mineral oil is that where air does not conduct the heat away fast enough to keep that spot from getting hot, the mineral oil does. Right. And so it transmits that heat away from that hot spot really quickly so that the mineral oil will heat up, but the, the computer component, that one single spot that gets hot. Right. Will... It dissipates right. it. You can even put like an aquarium bubbler in there and that will help move it around. Like you put the bubbler hmm. underneath the Raspberry Pi and that creates and enough movement to where it's going to, cool. yeah. Yeah. As we know from cooking, Air is not a good conductor, not an efficient conductor of heat, but yes. right. oil is. <laughs> yes, <laughs> so, which exactly. It's like five times more conductive. Right, right. That's cool. <laughs> uh, I do note that the link that we have for this does say vegetable oil, but it, it it's wrong. It should be mineral oil. Oh, yeah, I know. Yeah. yeah. That's cool. Uh, Thomas, what's what's your pick of the week? So my pick for the week is a website called freecodecamp.org. Um, it's you may have heard of them before. They've been on a lot of different um, uh, kind of promo sites and things like that. Uh, but the the real cool thing that they've started doing is that they have actual courses that they then provide a certificate of completion at the end that says you know mm. what you've completed. So 
Uh, they have a data visualization course. They have a machine learning course. They have some basic uh, web responsiveness and um, web design courses. Uh, and they're actually monitored. They've, they've like set out how many hours it should take you to complete the course and uh, have put together a certificate that actually is verifiable and says, hey, you could, you, know, you could take it and put it on your resume and say, I did this course. I have learned this thing. And by the end, you also have a product to show because you're it's a practical uh, where you're you're making the code as you go along hmm. and they, they make sure that you that you're displaying it somewhere so that it's not just uh you know it exists on your computer and no one's verified it or anything like that you have to kind of feed the code back to them and they check it but it's your code that you get to keep from that point so cool i really like it um it's it, it it's a uh, a couple of levels deep if you skip any of the first ones but the first few are really good intro to um to just coding HTML, JavaScript, CSS, stuff like that. Awesome. That's great. Uh, so my pick is a little device that I got for review, and uh, I've been trying it out, and it's been working well. Uh, it's called the Thermacell M Patio Shield Mosquito Repellent, which is it's deep-free, scent-free, uh, as they, they make the, the, the point. Uh, and it's kind of clever because it's not, it's not battery-powered. It's, um, it's not plug in what it is is there's two there's two main components to it. There's a, these little squares, little mats of a, um, I'm not even sure what it is, but it's got it's some kind of chemical that releases that mosquitoes don't like. And you have a little butane canister that plugs into the bottom of the thermocell, and you light it, and it creates a little flame and warms up the pad, and the pad emits a, a the the uh, stuff that only the mosquitoes can smell. In about a 15-foot area of protection. I've tested this out in my patio, um, sat outside, you know, for science, and uh, <laughs> it worked pretty well. And it lasts a long time. Uh, the pads eventually turn white, uh, which that shows you that it needs to be replaced. It comes with several pads, and they're, they're pretty inexpensive to get replacements. Uh, then there's the little butane refills as well. Uh, I assume they're butane. They're, they call them fuel cartridges, but it's some... Mm -hmm you know liquid that uh fuel that they burn and it works really well uh and it's uh they're not cheap it's 35 dollars but it's if you don't like citronella and you don't like um various you know insect repellents that you have to spray on that are not effective anyway uh this is a nice little alternative uh, for a you know cover yourself in a little small area I second this recommendation very, very much. We have two of them, and um, one of the ones we have has a belt buckle, and you can just buckle it to your belt and walk and go for a hike with it. Oh. And it is fantastic. It actually works. That is awesome. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. As as a scouter, <laughs> I can yep. tell you that that's one of the most annoying things is going on a hike and you know having to put the bug spray on. With this thing, I don't even put bug spray on. I just clip it to my belt and go. Do you know if it's safe to use in a tent? Um, I We have used it in a tent, yeah. Okay, all right. So Cause... It, it doesn't get hot enough. Uh, yeah. like like the, the heat that's generated is only enough to just like, warm. kind of melt the the yeah. or warm the stuff that's in there. Okay, because yeah, that's there's nothing more annoying than sleeping in a tent and having a mosquito buzzing around you, right. your head while you're trying to sleep. Yeah, um, I like the idea of being able to carry. I think it's that light and that you know safe is that you could carry it on on your person while you're hiking and mm -hmm. you, your personal shield travels with you. So that's, that's awesome. awesome. So cool. All right. Well, those are those are some good picks. Uh, and uh, let's. I think that's a good place to wrap it up. We want to take a moment to thank our patrons who make it possible for us to create secrets of technology, including Kelly G, Jacob S, Mary W, Andrew G, and Aaron M. Their generous donations at sqpn.com/give make it possible for us to continue the secrets of technology and all the shows at StarQuest. You can join them by visiting sqpn.com/give. So uh, let us know what you thought of our discussion. If you have any feedback, anything you want to ask us, you can go to, uh, and comment on the show at sqpn.com slash technology or the SQPN Facebook page, facebook.com slash StarQuest Media, or send an email to technology at sqpn.com. And of course, all the links from our discussion and our picks of the week will be on our show notes at sqpn.com. If you can, write a review of the show on Apple Podcasts. We've been getting some reviews, and they've been really great. We really appreciate it. Reviews help get the show in front of more people. That's just a fact. Uh, so we really do appreciate that. And when you share the show with your friends, 
we're here to help with technology information and that's that we're we're, we're not tech pundits we're not here to, to to go up into the stratosphere we want to uh, aim this stuff at a regular audience just like us uh so uh until next time thomas Sinerho, thank you for joining me and sharing the secrets of technology it was great to be here jack barazzini thank you as well thanks tom and once again i'm dom bettinelli thank you for listening to the secrets of technology on starquest <laughs>